Hi, everyone. Um, all right, so we are going to switch gears a little bit and, and talk about um, some of the biology and how it's responding uh, to the heat waves uh, that you've heard about in the last two talks. And I wanted to start out with this, uh, with this compendium of images. Um, these are just images that I pulled out of news releases uh, that were detailing uh, the effects of marine heat waves and warming um, on ecosystems. And uh, some of these are, are you know, your charismatic macrofauna. Um, some are not so exciting. These are mussels. Uh, they're hard to see. These are lobsters, dead crabs on the beach, a sea star, along with, along with some uh, larger organisms that we know. Uh, and so uh, I wanted to put that out there and, and, and get you to start thinking about who or, or what these organisms all rely on. And what they all rely on uh, are phytoplankton. And so what I'm going to talk about today is what happens when we start to heat up the base of the food web. We'll take a peek into phytoplankton responses to a warming world. And here's a quick picture of some phytoplankton. You'll see some in a moment. Um, but literally every drop of surface seawater in the ocean has phytoplankton in there. If it's a lighted part of the, of the world's ocean, there are phytoplankton in there. They're generating carbon that's good for fish and other organisms to be eating. So let's talk about those ecosystem services. I sit um, in Rhode Island, um, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that. Uh, so phytoplankton feed all of the fish we eat and all the fish we don't eat, which is also important. Uh, in Rhode Island, commercial and recreational fishing supports about 8,000 jobs and about 620 million in sales. And I bring that up because Rhode Island, of course, is, is the smallest state in the nation. And yet these are some big numbers relying just on what's happening outside our door. Phytoplankton generate half the oxygen we breathe. So if you've been sitting for a while through a couple talks, take a moment now to take a really big deep breath. That was all generated by the photosynthesis of phytoplankton in the ocean, even if you sit in Wisconsin or somewhere far from the ocean. Phytoplankton also use and bury much of the excess anthropogenic carbon that we produce. So they're really important for the health and welfare, not only of marine ecosystems, but for everyone on the planet. So phytoplankton conduct photosynth photosynthesis every day in and out. And I wanted to give you an entree into photosynthesis by asking you, well, who does photosynthesis on land? And that's, of course, the land plants. And you can see a nice lush uh, picture of a forest here. Um, and we tend to think of land plants as very diverse. They live all over the earth. Um, and I want to give you an ex example of where they sit on the tree of life. So here you have the tree of life. Bacteria have their own special tree. So this is just the eukaryotes. Um, but if we look at where land plants are on the tree of life, they sit here. Okay. So pretty much all photosynthesis on land is from that one branch on this very broad tree of life. We go into marine waters, that's a whole nother world. I'm gonna list out the phytoplankton, both marine and freshwater that are here on the tree of life. Okay, so you can see that the phytoplankton are really different from the land plants, both in terms of their diversity, very deep phylogenetic diversity. There are even some cyanobacteria. These were the very first phytoplankton. Uh, and, and also in terms, so in terms of their phylogenetic diversity, but also in terms of their life cycles, where they live and how they live. So phytoplankton are fundamentally different from land plants. And then in many cases, they're not plants at all, but they sit elsewhere on the phylogenetic tree of life. They're microscopic, but they can be very numerous. Here's a picture of some uh, red pigmented algae discoloring a bay. They're microscopic, but the chlorophyll pigment that enables them to conduct photosynthesis can be seen from space. So here's a, a light color image, a true color image of the US Northeast coast and Canada uh, from a satellite. And if we kind of change the satellite settings a little bit, we can look at um, the chlorophyll fluorescence from that water, emanating from that water with really high chlorophyll in red and lower chlorophylls in blue. So you can see some of this uh, amazing uh, variation in chlorophyll, even from space. And now I said they were microscopic, 
So, you know, one, teaching 101, I shouldn't now change and say, well, there's a big size range, but you'll remember this. So they're small, but even within that smallness, they have a huge size range. This is a really nice image from um, Zoe Finkel and colleagues uh, showing the, the range of size if we were to compare it to, to things that we know and love. So the smallest, in this example, we have the smallest phytoplankton up to the largest. And those smallest phytoplankton are equivalent in size, order of magnitude to fish in this example. And as we go from fish up to the city of Manhattan, that size range in meters here is the same order of magnitude changes in size range for the phytoplankton in micrometers, okay? So, and remember I said there are phytoplankton in every drop of water in the sunlit ocean. This kind of variation exists in that one drop or bottle of water that you might collect. So think about that next time you're out near the ocean. I wanted to show you some pictures of what this looks like. Uh, here's an image uh, put together by one of my graduate students, Stephanie Anderson, uh, of some phytoplankton from here uh, outside my door in Narragansett Bay. The smallest ones we can't show you because they can't really even be seen on the same scale. This arrow, if you're wondering, that is about the width of an average human hair. Okay, so that's about the size range that we're, we're working with um, in this talk. Some more images from Narragansett Bay. And these are scanning electron images so that you can see once we scan in, they're very detailed. They have a, um, really different kinds of coverings. This one has a cell covering made out of calcium carbonate. So we're kind of worried about this one when we think about ocean acidification. Um, these others have cell coverings literally made out of glass. Now, these organisms can precipitate glass even at temperatures below freezing uh, in the polar oceans. So really amazing physiologies too. Okay, so now you know a little bit about phytoplankton. We're in, this session is about forecasting. So what happens when we start to impose climate change on phytoplankton uh, in the form of water, warmer waters? Because of course there are other climate change impacts, but we're talking today specifically about warmer waters. I'm gonna share with you some observations and then talk a little bit about modeling. So if we look at heat wave observations, we find that heat waves can reshape phytoplankton communities, okay? So we heat up the water, and what starts to happen is that the organisms that were there before start to shift either in terms of their relative composition or we have new organisms that really um, appear on the scene. I'm gonna show you one quick example. Uh, this is from my student, Stephanie Anderson. Uh, and uh, what you can see here is a, an experimental heat wave that we imposed on a phytoplankton community. Um, here is an initial community at 2.6 degrees Celsius. Each color is a different phytoplankton species. They're listed here, but you don't have to worry about what the species are, just to know that they're different. And then here is uh, after about 10 days in an experimental conditions where they were kept at the same conditions, but also moved to higher conditions, higher temperatures and lower temperatures. And what you can see is that as temperature increases, we have one species that seems to do really well. And as temperatures decrease, we have other species that do really well. So temperature, you can think of it as a knob that can kind of shift and, and change these species. Um, why is that important? It's, a, it's important because the organisms that are out there feeding on these species may have particular prey preferences. Uh, the species may be uh, more or less nutritious. Some of these species, especially these cold water species we're looking at here, some of them have higher lipid concentrations in their cells than others. And so they may be uh, more nutritious uh, for, for the prey and then have an impact on the food web. So because they're the base of the food web, we're always really interested in changes that take place at this um, very base level. Okay, so. This is just a, basically a cartoon of what I just showed you. You have this initial community. As you take waters that are cold and you start to heat them up, you sort of sift the community and choose other uh, individuals, other species. One question we've also been asking is whether as we heat up the waters, the genetic compositions of these species changes. If we change their genetic composition, we're basically imposing evolution on them and we're potentially altering their fitness, okay, for the future. 
So we're starting to get really interested into how uh, heat waves aren't just like a knob on the ecology, but are they a knob on the evolution of these organisms too? So I'll show you an example from one experiment. Um, this is from a Toby, work that Toby Samuels did. Um, and basically what he's showing here is he had a heat wave of nine days in duration. You can see the duration here at the bottom. And then here are the number of live cells on the x-axis. And each of these panels is a different genotype or a different strain of the same species. It's like, you know, if you had Sunshine and myself like do a sprint we would have probably different times at which we could run that sprint. So we're basically asking different individuals from the species how well they survive under heat waves. And, and what we see is that both growth and death rates vary by genotypes. Here you're looking at the number of live cells decreasing over time, so they have a death rate. And that death rate differs depending on their thermal experience. Okay, so it might also be changing the fitness of a species. Okay, so what I just told you is that in the ocean, we think that warmer waters are changing species composition, and we think that maybe even it's having an influence on the evolutionary potential of these organisms. So those two knobs. So what's happening in models? Those models are meant to understand and predict climate in ch change impacts like heat waves. But phytoplankton are often treated as a single group, and you know better now, right, looking over at this phylogenetic tree. Or they're treated like small and large size fractions, which in some case could be true, but you know, you could treat them like fish or the city of Manhattan, leaving a lot of space in the middle, right? So we, um, <clears throat> so one of the things in these models, one of the key parameters for these models of looking at either size fractions or whether they're a bulk community or not, is the temperature growth relationship. This is a key parameter for models of marine primary production. And a single relationship is currently applied to all phytoplankton, despite what I've told you about vast differences in taxonomy, size, and physiology. And I will pause here to say I am not criticizing modelers or models, okay? The job of a good model is to reduce complexity, okay? So this is not a, a criticism, it's just to give you an idea of where the modeling community has been at. Here's that single relationship. Uh, we've been using something called the Epley curve. That was published the year I was born. And that's what we use right now, okay? So we asked the question, how do thermal traits vary among phytoplankton? rather than if we used this as a proxy for all phytoplankton, because since 1972, we have learned a lot about how diverse these phytoplankton are. We have discovered phytoplankton we didn't even know existed, whole branches of the tree of life we didn't know about in 1972. So our goals in this particular study were to examine the thermal responses of key phytoplankton taxa by compiling all known growth measurements from the four principal contributors to primary production in the ocean, and then make projections or forecast phytoplankton growth with ocean warming and understand the potential responses to marine heat waves. I'm gonna show you this um, slide from Stephanie's uh, paper that was just published last week. So people, this is still news. This is hot off the press. Uh, so here you see basically all the growth, known growth rate data for phytoplankton on earth. Uh, so this was a huge undertaking to compile all this data. Each of these lines represents a single species uh, or strain thermal response. So it was grown in the lab and they grew this, you know, one strain at five degrees, 10 degrees, 15, 20. And out of that, you get a thermal response curve, okay? And then we can use these thermal response curves to predict how these phytoplankton are gonna grow in response to climate change. And first I'm gonna show you our projection for the year 2100. And here we're using the CMIP-5 Earth system model with a worst case scenario, which is the RCP 8.5. And what you see here uh, are the four major contributors to, to primary production. Dark reds mean there's a proportional increase in growth change and blue means a proportional decrease and gray means a range expansion. 
Um, and what you can see, we can take this the coccolithophores as an example, there's a real decrease in their growth potential in the tropics and an increase um, towards the poles, towards higher latitudes. For cyanobacteria, you can see that there's some range increases in both the Northern and Southern hemisphere. And this panel basically summarizes all the data from these four panels. And what you can see is depending on what latitude you're at, there are going to be winners and losers in terms of the proportional growth change um, under this 2100 scenario. What this effort has done is it's given us new parameterizations for examining the phytoplankton response to climate change in both local and global ecosystem models. I have one last slide to show you about the consequences of heat waves. So here's that overview again with all the data. What I haven't mentioned before uh, or until right now are the different lines on here. This is that Epley curve, okay? That's the one curve that we use right now. And you can see how that curve works actually pretty well for diatoms but not so much for some of these other organisms. And the colored lines are the statistically, statistical best fit lines for the data that I'm showing you. And this is a panel showing just that best fit line for each of these organisms. And you can see that depending on where you might be on the slider of temperature, you're gonna see shifts in relative growth rates among different organisms or organisms that have you know, indistinguishable growth rates at one temperature, but that diverge as we increase and change temperatures. What I wanna point out here is that, you know, earlier I said I was not criticizing models, but model accuracy is really influenced by the data and the assumptions that we use when we're generating these models. So by refining and updating inaccurate data or inaccurate assumptions, um, we can really improve these models. And that's what this effort is doing so that our forecasting um, gets better and better. Okay, so I'm just gonna go over what I told you very briefly. Um, I hope now you know phytoplankton are incredibly diverse, that heat waves can reshuffle plankton communities and that can have a ripple effect on the rest of the ecosystem. And we've been developing new tools for testing hypotheses about the ecosystem consequences of heat waves uh, using things like these um, new curves representing growth rate response with temperature. And I just wanna end here um, and go back to our familiar faces. And what I hope I've done in this talk is added a new familiar face uh, when we think about marine ecosystem response to, food, uh, to heat waves and that these players at the base of the food web have really important implications for everyone else out there in the marine environment. And with that, I'll say thank you uh, and point out especially Stephanie Anderson, who, uh, I, whose work I talked about um, a lot in this particular talk. Thanks.